All right, let's get started. Let's rock. Hey, um, so let me say a couple things about life itself. <laughs> First off, um, if you don't, if you don't have a ticket for tomorrow night, make sure you pick one up. And if you want extras because you want to bring somebody, um, you can, I have extras. Okay. So make sure you get those after class. I have it. It's this one. This yeah. Okay, so first things first. Hey, we're coming into the last third of the semester. Whew. I know, that's how I feel, right? God. Imagine, when I was an undergraduate student, we had 10-week quarters. Um, that would mean we'd be finished with this class already, and you could move on with your lives. But as it is, we're stuck here for another five weeks, so... Um, I guess it's all what it's meant to be. Um, so a couple things. One, we're doing dips in the pond, meaning we don't really call them interviews, but they're information sessions for being an entry-level world and conversation facilitator next semester. We will be facilitating the Social 19 dialogues that will be different than they are this semester. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, by the way, that was pretty weak. <laughs> by you, not him. He did a great job, but the rest of you. Um, it's like, your, where's your heart, man? Get your heart in that, dogs. Okay, so, um, so what's happening, we actually, we, we're really digging in in a new way at World in Conversation, and we're growing the, the process, and so we did our first wave of information sessions last weekend. This weekend's the second wave. This might be the last one. Um, we have a bunch of openings, and you're not, you don't have to commit to anything. You're not committing to being a facilitator. You're not committing to being part of the class. You're not committing to a thing. Um, you're not committing to the time, to anything. You need about, it's going to be, say, like five hours a week or so. It's a four-credit class, so you get... Um, it's if you do what you're supposed to do, it's a guaranteed A, and it's not that difficult to do what you're supposed to do. Um, and you learn a lot. You really learn a lot. And you just um, go right here and just sign up for, the, for one of the information sessions and learn about it. Um, and if you, if you like asking questions and you like talking to people, and in particular we're going to be doing the facilitators next semester who come out of this class will be doing a lot of international dialogues with people in different parts of the world. So it's a really, it's a cool, it's a very, very cool, I personally, I think it's the coolest experience, uh, learning experience at the university, but I'm biased obviously, but I really could make a strong case for that. So um, I'll send another email and another text out as a reminder, but again, it's not a commitment. All you're doing is just learning about what, more about what it is. Um, We think it's the last weekend, too. So you got Saturday and you got Sunday. So, um, okay, tomorrow night is, is Brian Stevenson. If you weren't able to go to the other event and you're not able to go to this event, I will come up with a couple more. I'm not sure when they're going to be, but I will come up with them and I will make the announcement because I know some of you have class tomorrow night. There are any number of things. Uh, I would absolutely go to this if you can. It's going to be really good. He's really, really powerful. Very interesting guy and a really nice guy. Just a very thoughtful person. Okay? Um, okay. So we are going to go in a, a slightly different direction today and I want to talk a little bit about what I think is the, just one of the core intellectual issues or one of the core frameworks wait hang on hang on hang on hang on hang on wait (laughs) 
All right. So, uh, so there's the 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 key piece about science. Like you know, in the West, we're here. We're thinking scientifically, right? So, so science is about finding causality, and in all scientific endeavors, we're seeking causality, whether it's psychology or sociology or biology or physics, engineering, geosci, we're all seeking causality. Somehow, we're trying to understand how one variable impacts another variable. So if you change this, what's its impact on these things over here? Or if you change this one thing, what's its impact on this one thing here? If you change these five elements, how does it impact these other three elements over here? We're all seeking causality. And in a, in a class like sociology, we're really trying to understand what makes human beings tick, what makes us think the way we do, and what makes us act the way we do, and how is it that some groups are different than other groups? You know, what's behind it all? This is the complexity of life. And causality, when you talk about, when we're talking about human, hey, by the way, by the way, what I'm, what I'm actually saying right now is might be the only useful thing that I will say all semester. And that you, you, you've thought about it. If you've thought about, I'm sure you've all at some level thought about it already, but I'm framing it in a way that you will use for the rest of your lives. Yeah, it's, it's just awesome. This is the core. This is the key. In the world of sociology, we're, we're, or in the social sciences, we're trying to understand causality of human behavior. What leads people to behave in the ways in which they do? So for me, as an example, how is it that I'm up here as a college professor? So you could follow my life, you could follow my background, you could study all of the people with whom I had contact, you could study my deep brain psychology or psychosis maybe, as it might be. You could look at my family, you could talk to all my teachers, all my friends, you could go back and maybe trace some of the things I wrote or things I did as a kid, but you want to put all those factors and forces together and see if those things can explain how it is that I got right here as a college professor. And we're always doing that. We're trying to understand why is it that some people are homeless? Why are some people rich? Why are some people poor? Why do some people decide to pick up and leave their homeland and travel long distances to get to another place. So how do you explain refugees? Why is it that not everybody wants to come to another place? Wherever you have refugees, why did some people stay at home? There are other people who live right next door to the people who are refugees. And they're still back home. But this other family, they decided that they were going to get in a boat and cross the Mediterranean and show up in southern Italy. How? Why? The world of social science leads us to those questions that we're seeking causality, always. Why is it that, how, how did white people end up on top in the U.S.? In, your, in the Western world. Like, why do white people, as a, in a rule, as a rule, have more power than other groups? Who's going to have more power in 40 years from now? Is China really going to be ruling the world? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. To get to the answer of that, you're going to start looking at lots of different variables. Well, what's the growth rate and what's the population and what are the decisions that are getting made about this and about that? And, you know, you're going to look at all of these factors and forces and then you're going to make some assessment about whether China might actually be running the world in 40 years or 50 worlds, years. And you might say yes, you might say no, but you're going to start looking at all these factors and forces. It's causality. What causes? it why some of you have friends who are hooked believe it or not 
who maybe are, are hooked on opioids. They're hooked on oxy, let's say. Maybe you have friends who died from oxy. Maybe you have family members. Maybe you have parents. Why? What led them and not somebody else? So maybe you have a group of friends and some of your friends are addicts and others aren't. And maybe, you know, you were doing the same things that they did. And they just kept going down this path, but you stopped. You just said, nah, I'm not going to go there. But they kept going. Why? What's the causality? Is it biological? Is it something in them? Is it that they were, ah, oh, you think back to when you were young, they were always striving for something more than what they had. Their parents, their family, maybe they just had some kind of seeds of doubt in their lives that they just really didn't fully understand. Or they, but you're, you know, you go back. Like, for example, those of you who have friends or family member who have committed suicide, how many hours of conversation have you spent asking the question, why? Rolling over everything in your brain, but what about this and what about that? And it could have been, and then somebody else enters the conversation and you start going in a slightly different direction. You're all seeking causality. Is it their family? No, they made a choice. It's like, they cho- why'd they do that? Well, it wasn't a choice. Maybe they're, yeah, but they, I feel like they were always depressed. It, you know what? It was when, the, it was when you know, my friend's father uh, left the family. That moment, it, somehow it changed them forever. I don't know what it was, but oh, okay. The cause of your friend's suicide is that their father left the family. And then you say, ah, oh, yeah, but he, let me think about this. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, he lost his job. And then he started drinking. And once he started drinking, everything fell apart. And then that's when he left. And it's like, oh, okay, I get it, right? One thing, and then you you see you're you're seeking causality. This is the world of sociology. It's the world of psychology. If you've ever been in therapy, you know, you sit and you talk to a therapist because you're really trying to understand yourself and like, you know, how to get here and what am I doing here and how to happen. And so in sociology, what, one, what we're doing is trying to understand large patterns of behavior for lots and lots of people. And here's the deal. Okay, you got it, right? I got it. Here's the deal. Causality can be divided into two things. So here's this line on the floor right here with this cable. On one side, we have choice. These are all the things that we do to ourselves. So your friend who committed suicide, they, in the end, they made a choice. And they just, as your friend who's, who's, got, who's an addict, or your parent, or you, you're making a choice. Just stop drinking. It's actually really pretty simple. Just stop drinking. Just don't drink anymore. You're making a choice. Every time you pick up the bottle, those of you who are alcoholics, every time you pick up the bottle and you take alcohol in one form, you're making a choice. So just make a different choice. It's really simple. The causality is about the choices you make. Hey, you're not doing well in school. Then make the choice to do better. Just study more. Come on, stop playing around. Stop watching sports. Come on, man. The NCAA, the March Madness is coming up. Oh, my God. I hate March Madness. You know, so it comes up and you all go like, oh, I actually don't hate March. I only hate it on the very first Thursday because everybody's watching games in class, right? So stop watching sports. Stop paying attention. Just stop. It's really simple. And study more. It's all about choice. That's the stuff on this side. And over here, ah, it's not about, it's factors and forces outside of our control. Study more. Wait, I can't really study more because I'm holding down three jobs. Why am I holding down three jobs? Because both my parents got reduced work hours and they can't pay for my college like they used to be able to pay for my college. I'm working three jobs. I'm working 35 hours a week. I can't study anymore. It's not about me. I would choose to study. I'd love to be over here and making that choice to study. Like, yeah, man, I got to put more hours in. Like, come on, I took my social 19 quiz and I only spent three hours reading five hours worth of stuff. Like, that was such an idiot. I could have just, oh. 
And so for one person, that's it. Yeah, I'm an idiot, man. I just chose to hang out with my friends the, night, the two nights before the quiz, and I didn't do all the readings, and I didn't do really well. And another person down here is like, well, I wish that was my problem, but my problem is I'm working 35 hours a week. Like, I don't know how the rest of you all pay for school, but like, I pay for my own school, and it's 35 hours a week, and it's really hard. I didn't have to do that last year. This year, it was, it's a little bit different. One thing after another after another. Everything is about you. Why am I a college professor? How much of it has to do with my skin color? How much of it has to do with the fact that I'm a man? How much of it has to do with the fact that I'm not three foot eight? I'm five, ten and a half, five eleven. What if I was three foot eight? How would I do as a college professor in here? How do you, how did successful would I be if I was three foot eight? How many of you all would be like, oh, yeah, that's Sam, dude. Like, yeah, he's pretty cool for a little guy. How would, it, how would I be, how successful would, have I, would I be if I had a really high squeaky voice and that's just how I talk? And you think everybody would be like, oh, yeah, school is a great class. You'd be like, I fucking can't stand that motherfucker's voice. Like, God. <laughs> and so, like, yeah. So, but, you know, like 20 of you, would stick it out. And you'd be like, oh, no, it's cool. You just got to get past the voice thing. And like, dude's all right. Like, he's got something to say. But yeah, he's only three foot eight. You can't see him over the first row of people. But like, yeah, whatever. Like, how, what would it be? The fact that I'm a man. The fact that I have a wife and I don't have a husband. These days, that doesn't matter so much. But go back 30 years, right? So where are we? How much of these things matter? The fact that I grew up working class. Yeah, I'm a college professor. I grew up working class. So you think like, whoa, I made some serious decisions because I'm working class. You know, you know, like I pay for my own school. Like, yo, it's tough. You know what I mean? Like, yo, man, I didn't go to sixth grade summer camp because my mom couldn't afford $10. And like today, that would be like $30. And so I just didn't go. I did shit like that. I was working full time at the age of 14. And I had, I had my first business when I was 12 years old. I was paying for my school clothes when I was 12 and 13 years old. If I wanted school clothes, I paid for them. So like, obviously, I made a lot of decisions to get here. But what about all the things that maybe I decisions I didn't make? Every job that I ever had was nepotism. My brother got me a job when I was 14. That's nepotism, right? So I'm white. How much does that help? Everybody I work with, say for a couple of people, were white. How much of it, what, what would it, what would it, how different would it have been? So I'm working class. I wasn't destitute poor. I wasn't homeless. I wasn't on the streets. So yeah, my mom couldn't afford the $10 to send me to camp, but whatever, I had a roof over my head. It's all good, right? I had other things. So like, yeah, I made a lot of choices, to help me get here, but there were other things that were in place that really helped me out. Like when my father died, our house, we, with my parents had bought a house and it was paid off. And how much of the fact that they were able to even get a loan to buy the house had something to do with the fact that they were white? If they hadn't been white, would they have gotten the loan from the bank at the interest rate that they did? So maybe they would be like, yeah, we went to this bank and that bank and this bank and that bank. And we kept going all around and around and around. We couldn't get a loan to buy the house. So they never bought the house. So when my dad died, they didn't have a house. And then my mom were paying rent and we're struggling and like, oh, my God. So no matter what, I'm trying to make the choices, but, I, but, I'm, but the choices are being shaped by things outside of my control. And you see choice and chance. They go together all the time. It's choice, it's chance. And we live, here's the key, my friends. We live in a bifurcated world whereby... We, it's almost impossible to stand right on this line all the time. That we either go to choice or we go to chance. But stay right here because there's not a single issue that's not both choice and chance. There's not a single issue in the world that's not both. It's always both. Yeah, I'm here because I made a lot of choices to be here. There's no question. And there were a lot of things that I got that I'll never know about. 
man, a lot of benefits that I got that I will never, ever understand. I still don't see them. And I made decisions. And I got benefits. One thing after another. You see, you see how it goes? Choice, chance. So in the world of race relations, one of the things we're struggling over is why do some groups have more power than other groups? Why do some groups have more advantages than other groups? What accounts for that? What accounts for some groups being able to kind of move forward ahead of other groups? What, what's going on? You know, the police. Yeah, are the police like really an obstacle to black and brown people? To what degree are the police, do the police systematically engage in racist, discriminatory behavior that across the board harms the lives of large numbers of black and brown people? To what degree? This is a question. We're looking at it. Is it choice? Is it chance? Like what goes on? So yes, oh, another black man is beaten up or harmed or worse yet, killed by the police. What's the first thing we do? We ask, what did he do? What were his actions? Down here in the world of choice. Not everybody. So some people, it's what did he do? What were her, his actions? All of the choice stuff. Other people down here go right to, ah, well, yeah, of course, the police are a racist institution and we see this all the time. And it's like, yeah, okay, yep. So we see it. We're more likely to see it. The police bringing harm to people who are black and brown than bringing harm to white people. But it doesn't happen all the time. And so like, how do you sit with that? How do you manage that? You see, this comes into play all the time, everywhere. Got it? You see that? You, if, you, if you see, if you, can, if you can sit here in the center and hold these two things and know that every time you get in an argument about anything related to human behavior, you're arguing about causality. You're arguing about, you want to argue whether Donald Trump is good or bad? You're arguing about causality. You're just going to look at all the factors and forces that come into play to decide whether, is he a good thing for the world or is he a bad thing for the world? That's all you're doing. Got it? Okay? So here, let's do... Oh, wait, and by the way... Here's something. When it comes to other people messing up, we always go to choice first. We always go to choice first. When it comes to us messing up, we go to chance first. We go to things outside of our control. Because we can identify certain things. And by the way, what's the one group of people? I don't know if I asked this. The semesters roll into one or another. I don't really know. What's the one group of people who take responsibility for their F-ups more than any other group? Did I ever ask you that question? What's the one group of people, Mom? that we see across the board that are more likely to say, when they mess up, they're more likely to say, nah, I'm responsible for that, man. Anyone want to guess? Bro, you want to guess? One group of people. Now here, stand up real fast. I'm going to have you. Wait, what's your name again? Alec. Alec. Alec, look at, all, look at people. Pick out the demographic. Male, female, whatever. What's the demographic of the people who are most likely to say, when I mess up, it's my own fault? I who do you no think? Idea. Look around. Just, just go ahead. I have like no bald motherfucker, Bald people like him? <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> White guys, blonde people, Asian women. Just take a guess. Take a wild guess. Just look around. Pick somebody out. What do you think, man? I don't know. Take a guess. Who do you think is most likely to blame themselves for their problems? Uh, I 
guess Asians. Asians? All right, good guess. Thanks, man. What do you think? Think about all these people here. Who do you think it is? Blame themselves for their problems. What's your name? Who do you think? I said men. Men? Men blame themselves? Yeah, at least likely. The class disagrees with you. Do you have a thought? Um, I don't know. Maybe like Middle Eastern. Middle Eastern people? What's that? I misunderstood. I meant to say... Oh, you, you thought it was least oh, yeah, likely. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, yeah, most yeah. likely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so women, women. Yeah. 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 So men are the opposite. Listen, man. So the answer is, this is the irony, right? I love this. The answer is black men are more likely to blame themselves. White people are more because black, that's a sur- sur- survival mechanism. Because black, look, first off, black Americans... Just in the United States, black people are socialized, look, in the black community, that if you want to get ahead in this world, you need to be responsible for yourself. The man, the system is not going to help you and not going to look out for you. And if you want to get ahead, if you want to climb these stairs of upward social mobility, it's all about you, my friend. Do not expect anyone to come along and give you a handout to help you up to, if you fall down. All these one after another. That is the story in the black community by far and away. And so when we ask black men, even more than black women, all right, man, you screwed up. So you got a problem here. You're flunking out of school. You're doing this. You're doing that. You got caught shoplifting. You got caught this. You got caught that. Who knows? Whatever it is. It's the black man that's going to say, yeah, I know, man, I screwed up. Not, oh, the system's oppressive, the system's holding me down, the system's... That, that's what white people think, in particular, that black people think. Because that allows white people to not take responsibility for systems that are stacked against certain groups of people. Because if I can sit back and be like, yeah, man, you know, my problem is... You know, black people, my issue with black people or brown people, what are parties? I don't know. Is it like, yeah, it just seems like they're always blaming the system. It's like, it's actually the opposite. The problem is they blame themselves more than they probably should. White people, by contrast, are most likely to blame the system, which is ironic. Because that's not the story. The story is that it's like, yeah, white people, we like pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and we do what we need to do to move ahead and we take care of ourselves. And it's all these like black and brown, the minorities. You got it? You see that? Dude, this is the sociology class. So we're always taking things and we're turning them on their heads and looking at the other side. But you wouldn't know that because how many of you, just people who are not black in this classroom, how many of you have ever sat, I'm not talking about the, the, the tel, what's, who's on television, who makes it on television, talking about race issue? Well, that's going to be like some sort of activist who's going to be talking about race, institutionalized racism and institutionalized discrimination. And that's, the, that's all you're going to hear because that's an activist. That's their job. Like me, I'm going to talk about sociology. If you want to ask me to talk about something else, well, I'd love to just talk about nature and bunnies and how soft bunnies are and how lovely they are and how nice it is to just hold a bunny and the soft fur and how the fur gets so soft. And but I'm never you're never going to hear me talk about that because I don't have a platform to talk about bunnies. So you will never hear me talk about it. So if the only platform I ever get as a black man, let's say, or a black person or some kind of activist to talk about racism and institutionalized racism, then that's going to be then that's all you're going to hear. But how many people who are not black have ever sat around in a focus group and actually had a conversation with a wide mix of people who have darkly pigmented skin about what is the cause of inequality, race and ethnic inequality in the United States and the degree to which black people and brown people are are responsible, more responsible for their place in the system than anybody else. 
our most recent. How many people have ever had that conversation? Anybody? One person? I have many times. If you're a facilitator at World in Conversation, you'll have a lot of these kinds of conversations. And so, like, so you never hear. You never actually hear what the conversation is. But when you sit around and you talk about black people, man, it's just like, oh, my God. You know, it's not about blaming the man. It's not about blaming white people. It's just about assessing the struggles that, 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 that are in, within the only community. It's about taking responsibility, man. Take responsibility. That's the message. So much so that actually, ironically, I feel like some, that very oftentimes black people go too far by taking almost all the responsibility for stuff. And sometimes, like, I got to convince people, like, hey, dude, hang on a second. There is this thing called white racism, you know, that's also responsible for some of the stuff that you're going through. And I'm not, and, I, and I'm like not in the, I mean, I, I, I lean toward conservatism. I lean toward over here. I'm a registered libertarian, my friends. And a registered libertarian is a hardcore freedom and personal responsibility. So I am registered in the political party that is most hardcore about being right here. You want to move forward? Take responsibility for yourself. You want to, you want to get ahead in the world? You are responsible for getting ahead. Don't blame any other people. Don't look to other people. Don't look to the government for any help whatsoever. Do it on your own. That's the hardcore libertarian perspective. That's the political party that I am registered for to keep me sane. And yet, me, with that, what I'm telling you is sometimes I have to come over here to, like, convince sometimes black people, like, stop this, like, kind of taking all the weight of the responsibility for some of the shit that you're going through. Like, stop talking like a libertarian because sometimes you got to see the system. And sometimes you don't. And sometimes people see the system and sometimes they wrongly see it and it's a problem and, like, okay, got it. Some, yes, I hear black people and brown people and Hispanics and Asians, I hear people of color blaming things outside of their control in times when they really need to be blaming themselves. So I hear that a lot because I'm in the conversations a lot. But within the community, I hear a lot of libertarian thinking. Wow. Wow. Dudes, okay, so listen, man, okay, now I'm going to, just for a second, because there are a lot of black and brown conservatives in here too, right? Don't look at a black or brown person and immediately think that they're not conservative, because there are growing numbers of black and brown conservatives, right? So look, here, white people, what do you know about black people? What do you know about choice and chance? Really, what do you know? What do you know about what black people really think? I'm not talking about the activists on television. I'm talking about what people really think. Got it? Not what your uncle said. Not what your father said. Not some narrative story that you get. No, I want to know what people really think. What do you know? And what I'm suggesting is you may not know everything you really need to know. You may not really understand how people think. You know what I mean? Because how can you know if you're not there? It's like, it's awesome. That's why, that's why I love doing this kind of work because it's just, okay, here. Check this out. So this past weekend, so I just flew, last night I flew back from Naples, Florida. And that's me, obviously, and my wife. And we were given a talk. Naples is one of the wealthiest zip codes in the United States, if not the wealthiest. And we spoke, these are all private jets. We, that's Lori on a private jet, right? We didn't fly on the private jet, but um, this guy back here, he was buying a private jet, okay? They were selling this jet here, right? This is like, we, these are all jets around here. We're, there were hundreds, my friends. I'm like, I'm, in, I'm like, I, the people on this stage, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but we had, we had a billionaire, another billionaire, another. So we're talking at this conference, right, about this stuff. Dudes, see these two knuckleheads right there? 
do you know how I don't I couldn't be part of this community in a million years. You could give me ten billion dollars, I couldn't be part of this community. I'm not I don't even I don't know how to act. I don't know how to think. I don't know how to, it's not me. It's like this free oh, give me ten million dollars and or ten a billion dollars and I'll be no you wouldn't. Are you kidding me? No, you wouldn't. You'd still be the silly schlep that you are unless you come from that kind of money and you've been socialized with it and that's who you really are because you don't even know. You can't even, I can't even, at this stage in my life, I can't even adjust the way I, I even breathe around that kind of stuff. It is so foreign to me and I, and I engage. I've met many and worked and met many billionaires and billionaires and done and have traveled around the world in first class and so on and so sleeping on beds on transatlantic flights. But I am, I will never be comfortable with that. I could never be that. It just wouldn't make it happen. We are who we are. And it's really deep. And so this idea that somehow we can just change ourselves and we can go here and we can go there, it's like, nah, man. Life is just immensely complex. Choice and chance. I could no more make the choice to go down that road than I could make the choice to, I don't know, take my clothes off right now and moon everybody. This is not even possible. It's not there. It's not even, it's not part of the DNA of reality. And it's awesome because that just means that we're living these immensely complex lives. You know what I mean? All right, man. So you ready? I got one for you. So the other day we were talking about skin whitening cream. And, uh, and I was thinking about this after we left. And first off, let me go ahead real fast. Remember I brought, wait, who's the Nigerian that was up here? You, right? You're Nigerian? So I brought you up here and I was asking you about skin whitening cream and you like didn't really know and like, right? Am I right? Skin whitening? Nigeria's 190 million people. It's estimated 70 million Nigerians out of 190 use skin whitening cream. That's why I'm surprised. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know? Like, what do you mean? Like, you're not in this conversation? You don't know? 70 million people. That's almost 40% of the population. It's huge. It's like... And so this idea that this is all new to all of us. It's like we don't even have ways to understand this stuff. So I come back to skin whitening cream. And I'm like, nobody tells, nobody for, holds anybody. Uh, you take a dark skinned person, darkly pigmented skin. So here we are, her, her, this half of her, right? This half of her. And somewhere you get a message to put skin whitening cream on, okay? You get a message. These people, dude, 70 million people in Nigeria, Come on, man. Some of these are babies. So you got another 30,000 young infants. So, that, you know, you only got like 90 million people realistically who aren't using it. Why? What leads people to use skin whitening cream? What leads black, dark-skinned people to use skin whitening cream? What? Is it choice? Is it down here? Are people just making the choice? Are 70 million people in Nigeria just saying like, yeah, you know, we are a black society... In Western Africa, black-led, white people are not dominating our world anymore. This is all about us. We have our own music industry. We have our own arts industry. We have our own television industry, our own movie industry. We have, like, everything we need. And yet, and yet, nah, man, what we need is, like, lighter skin. What is that? Is it choice? Yeah, we're just choosing to have light skin because it's kind of like cool. You know what I mean? It's just beautiful. Or is something else going on? It's like, what is that? Or is it both? What is it? So skin whitening cream, what is that? Why do people do it? Why would you do that? 
To think that it's only this and there's no choice involved would be stupid. Like what? Like fucking the white people? Like what, Americans are like holding all dark-skinned people down? We got them in like headlocks here and we're rubbing skin whitening cream all over your faces? It's like, no, we're not doing that. It's not happening. That would be just stupid to make that argument. And then equally down here to say like, nah, man, you know what I mean? Of all the things you can kind of do, and you just like, yeah, we just, yeah, well, we were thinking, you know, we just kind of want to change it up a little bit. So we could actually put this cream on to make us darker, which would be really kind of cool too. You know what I mean? Like, hey, let's all just get really dark because that's cool. Or we could just put this cream on to make us lighter. So like, ah, we'll just choose the lightning cream. Cream, why not? It's a choice. Go dark, go light. Ah, who cares? I don't really know. It's just a choice. I'm just making a choice, right? And yet the whole world's going toward whitening. Who's using darkening? It's whitening. So therefore, you can't go there. That would be a dumb argument to make. And you can't go here to say like, no one's making a choice at all because clearly that's not the case. So somehow the two are working together. You know what I mean? You never take choice out of the equation, ever. Ever. Hey, Sam, somebody left these in the back. There's a name on them. It's uh, for Lauren. 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 L Lauren. Oh, it says it's your birthday. Doug. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. Oh, my God. Lauren Harris. Wait, how old are you? 22? Oh, yeah. oh, you're old, man. Thanks. Oh, happy birthday. Hey, someone needs to sing bir happy birthday to Lauren. No, 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 hang on, one person. Wait, hang on, you want to do the whole class? No, I yeah. one person. Well, hang on, one person. It's got to be a guy. A guy? Yeah, dude. No, it doesn't have to be a guy, but I want it to be a guy. No, it could be. No, hang, you're not a guy. No, hang on. No, is there a guy who sings, like, really sings, like, really nail it? Who, who's, who, who's got it? Dude, do you sing? No, hang on. Who's, who really sings? Come on, who wants to do it? I know you can. Do you sing? I do sing. All right, come on, man. Let's have you do it. All right, come on. All right. All right. Happy birthday. You got it? Yeah, what, I got what's it. your name? No, I like kind of sing. You kind of sing? I ca I'm Kyle. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, hang oh, on. Yikes. Come here. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, you yes. got it? Can you really? Yeah, I mean, I got it. You got it? Got good. All right, here we go, man. Wait, it's Lauren, remember. Lauren, yes. Yeah, find your rock. Find your. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. To you, happy birthday, dear Lauren. Happy birthday to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Thank man. You. Yeah, enjoy. <laughs> hey, nice, thanks. All right. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, uh, you got the skin whitening thing, right? You got it? You see that? So, like, you see how that works? It's both. Can't be, can't not be both. That's, that's what I mean. Like, so what happens sometimes people who are minoritized in some way, um, you, you here's, dudes, oh my God. Yeah, man, I'm good. I just had one of those brain moments. I wish I could just download my brain to you. And I, not really. I wouldn't impose that on anybody. But No. No, dude. 
No, you wouldn't want that. Okay, so listen. Let me just talk to those of you who are minoritized in some way, whether you're part of the queer community, queer community black, brown, um, doesn't matter. Religious minority. Sometimes we get lost in an explanation of things. And we get lost in one side or the other. Okay? You get, when, just remember, pull yourselves back because you want to always account for both things. I can't even... I wish I could tell you what I was thinking. I, I wish I could download my brain. I can't, so... I'm done. Uh, shoot. All right, such is life. Does anyone want to say anything about that, by the way, before we move forward? Okay. Dude. I would just be interested to hear your argument about on why that would be a function of chance. Why well, it would be a function of chance. People deciding to make their skin. Yeah, because we live in, in yes, yeah, so we live in a system that up and down. Well, where I was last weekend, there were there were a few black people. It was almost all white. We live in a racialized world. We live in a racialized society. Like the United States is built on a racialized system of color and privilege, right? Like if you had if you had dark skin, you just inherently are less privileged by the nature of the either A, you're Native American, and so you have no value whatsoever, or B, you're either a slave or potentially a slave, and if you're not a slave, then you've got to be like a, a unique case. Because there were black people in the U.S. In the, in the days of slavery who owned slaves, right? But very few. I mean, the vet, so it's a racialized system. White people were poor. The vast majority of white people in the early days were poor. But you could be poor, but if you were black, you were in a particular place. So it's a racialized system. It still is. We haven't gotten out of it. It's much less racialized than it ever was. Are you kidding me? Look around. There are black people in this room. We're going to talk about this. There are black people in this room whose families, black and brown people in this room, whose families could buy and sell half the white population in this room. Because they have so much money. And you don't even know it, right? You look, when we talk about a racialized system, that assumes that, oh, each black person or each brown person is poor. Come on, man, are you kidding me? Like, n no, that's not it. But it's a racialized system whereby there's a certain privilege that comes with skin color. That you like Privilege, not privilege in a holistic way. Because me having white skin wasn't privileged last weekend. I'm still poor compared to these folks. I mean, I'm rich. If I go to Haiti, but I'm, or if I go to rural West Virginia, but here I'm poor. And so, like, you see what I mean? It's still a system. So it benefits people to just have lighter skin. Lighter skin is more beautiful. It's portrayed as more beautiful. Lighter skin is portrayed as hey, you're, you're less likely to have. Look, if you go for a job interview, you take two black people, and they're exactly the same, the lighter skinned person is going to get treated better than the darker skinned person. We know this across the board. Police are less likely to be, they're going to treat lighter skinned people, and I don't mean white people, I mean lighter skinned, like brown people, better than dark brown people. Well, across the board, we see that. And so that's what I mean about kind of the race license. So it's like ingrained historically to pass. So, like the whole passing thing, I'm going to give you one more thing, right? So, all throughout slavery, so what we have, we see this blending of white blood and black blood. And a lot of it is just slave owners and white people in general taking liberties with black women and then having children who are mulatto or who are both. And sometimes the children come up, are really light skin. And then the goal is to have your child pass, pass as white. Why is that? Because if they pass as white, then they're going to come, what's going to come along with that are certain privileges. That is part of an interracialized system. So it's like we, we've got hundreds of years of building a racialized power system. And so like, well, it doesn't strike me that people all around the world would want to have lighter skin. That's what we see. That's the standard of beauty. 
Everywhere we see that. It's a standard. I go to, I, I look at, I, you know, whether I go to Colombia or, you know, I was in Iraq or I go to, you know, when I'm in Ethiopia or where, uh, where when I was in the, just, I was in, when I, I'm in the Philippines. I'm wherever I am and I go and I see those beauty magazines. It's always people with lighter skin. It just is. That's the standard. So it makes sense that anybody, any schmuck out there in the world like me, if I have darker skin, I'm going to wish it was a little bit lighter because that's what I've been born into. Like, for example, just like you, bro, if I said, if I took you as a child, if all you ever knew was, you know what? Are you straight? I know you're not. You're just asking the question. So I'm not like, all right. So here, here's my final answer. This is awesome. This is an awesome example, dude. If I took you as a child and all you ever knew was the following, because you're straight, the ideal woman, the ideal woman, all you ever knew and all you ever saw was the ideal woman was four feet, two inches tall, 200 pounds. and completely flat chested okay that's all you ever saw and women all around you were trying to be four feet two inches tall 200 pounds and getting rid of their breasts having breast removal surgery and that's all you ever saw and that's what people told you and that was in the media and that was in magazines today you would think oh look at her yo she's really hot to the girl, the young woman who's four foot, two inches tall, 200 pounds and flat chested. You'd be saying like, yeah, she's really hot. That's how it is, my friends, which makes it so silly that we try to be something other than what we are or that we think in these standards of beauty that we choose them. We don't choose them. This is like, this is like the dumbest thing in the world. It's all been imposed on us, standards of beauty. Like when you look in a mirror, and you think you're beautiful, you're ugly, or you're this, or you're that. That's fucking, that's stupid. Like, that's just utter ignorance. You've just been told that. You've told something. It's like, unless you're just, whatever you see, you think is beautiful. Because that's the truth. It's all beautiful. Nothing's ugly. So if that's it, then that's not stupid. So I should reverse that and say, thinking anything's ugly. Dude, does that make sense? And so it's the standard. Not quite. <laughs> Right, would you say that the biological markers are irrelevant then? That I should, even if I'm born to think that one standard of attractiveness is just the status quo or the de facto attractiveness, that even if people mm -hmm. deliberately look different than that, that I'm still going to be attracted to them? Well, if people well, have we told me that I should be? Okay, so the only, the only thing we've ever been able to ascertain, and people are really seeking this right now, is that there might be some sort of biological disposition to a couple things. Are you ready? Symmetrical faces. Okay, got it. So there's one. Doesn't matter what the face is. Doesn't matter how big the nose is, how white, how the eyes are, whatever it is. It's just symmetry, right? Symmetry. Got it? And two, some kind of curve seem to be in the, maybe some kind of in, in a little bit of a DNA thing. I've been seeing some stuff, but there's nothing else. Everything else is just learned. Everything's learned. Whatever you think is pretty or not pretty or this or that, or it's all learn. I just tell you. So shit. So you see certain images over and over and over again. You start to imagine that those are the images. I mean, it's just really dumb. You got it? And so that's not a choice. That's over here. That's life down here. It's like leading us down a path and we think we're choosing. Here. Let me give you another one. Does that make sense, bro? There's no DNA involved in that. I would just like to think that I, as a biological human being, would be able to recognize if someone's deliberately making themselves less physically fit and legitimately chopping off parts of their body. Dude, physically fit is like, again, that's all just created. It's all created. Physically fit could be putting on, you know, could be me physically fit in, in a different culture would be me putting on twice as much weight as I have. 
you understand. And then all I got, it doesn't take much to convince you that like, oh, that's Sam, dude. He's like really fit. I want to be like him. You know, it doesn't take much. I understand that historically, in some cases, larger people have been more physically Or skinny attract. people, let's say. Or perhaps even larger people. That's a legitimate yeah. example that larger people have historically been more attractive because that's a sign of wealth and yeah. uh, a sign that that person will be more capable of producing healthy children, giving them yep. a good, reasonable life. I'm not convinced that someone who's four foot, 200 pounds, who's... But you just made the argument. You just made the argument because you said historically that was the case. And then history changes because we change our interpretation of things. I know I, I love what you're doing. Like you're thinking out loud for lots of people in the room because lots of people are thinking that, especially women. Who you, like, you go out in your damn Halloween costumes thinking like, oh, I got to look like this. Fuck that. No, you don't. <laughs> like, stop being assholes. You know what I mean? I've like sworn. Oh, that's, like, I've, that's like six swear words today. Like, damn, that's pretty cool. I dropped three F-bombs in one day. All right? So do you, you don't have to do that. So, yeah, you just made the argument. It's historically, it changes. And so it's like, all well, right, Well, it's whatever. historically related to survival. Like, the end goal is still that was the standard of attractiveness because it's the most likely yeah, to ensure I got you. you. I got you, but even then, dude, survival for most of history is most people were really, really, re I, I, got, I get where you're going here, I get it, but you don't have to go to, to deep anthropology at this stage because that's, that's like really, in a way, that's like only evolution 101. Go to evolution 605, right? It's different. It doesn't, it's not that, it's, not, it's actually really complex. I'll, so, I'll let you continue here then. I think, I think we just have flipped opinions then that you think the culture is what inspires our sexual preference, whereas I would argue in private perhaps that um, it's the other way around, that rather our biology influences okay. our culture. Our okay. sexual preference influences our yeah, culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you. listen. No, both, it's a big circle, right? So, no, your argument is well made. It's well taken. It is a big circle. What I'm saying is I can disrupt that circle at any moment and change the way we think about things. And we're thinking we're making choices and we're not. So I'm going to give you an example right here, okay? Um, and I like to think that I make choices, except I know that I don't. Okay, so here we go. Okay, ready? Can I get a, uh, I need a, I need a volunteer. And I need, no, it's got to be a woman. Um, I need a, 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 fee, a, a, is that you? Okay, come on down. Here, you, you actually sit, you sit here. Okay? So here's what's up. We're going to do a role play. You ready? Oh, yeah, it's a role play. And you're coming in for a job. You look, you look like you're dressed for an interview, the whole nine yards. What's your name? Wait, hang on. What's your name? Paola. Paola. No. Paola. Pao. Paola. Paola. No. Pao with a P? P. Paola. 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 Close. Where are you from? Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Okay. Paola. Okay. So here. <laughs> so here's what's up. We're gonna do we're gonna do a mock job interview, okay? This is a study that somebody did. And we're gonna walk through this mock job interview, okay? You're coming in to work for, at Social 119, World in Conversation. I don't know. You're the job, right, with me, mm -hmm. and I'm doing the interview with you. So, Paula. No, you can call me P. P. Yo, P. Okay. So, um, so what's your what, what's your What's your major? Nursing. Nursing? I mean, why nursing? What, what got you into nursing? Um, I like helping people. Hold making the them mic feel close. better. I like helping people and making them feel better. Uh-huh. Yeah. And where are you from? Where's your family from? Uh, originally Puerto Rico, but we live in Philly now. Uh-huh. And where, so where are you from in the U.S.? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Um, and you, live, you're, you have siblings? Yes. So how long, what makes you be really interested in this job working as a... Clinic clinician at World in Conversation. 
Well, I feel like I have a lot of experience with helping people and having people look at different uh, scenarios. Hmm. Okay. Do you have a boyfriend? No. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so what? Give me some. Give me some something else. Have you ever like? So you're in nursing. Did you have you ever worked in a hospital? No. Yeah. All right. Hey, do you think, P? Do you think uh, men find you attractive, physically desirable? Um, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, and how about um? So those are interesting boots that you have on. Are they boots? What is that? Yeah, they're boots. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, d um, another question is kind of interesting. Do you think women should wear bras in the workplace? Um, that's up to them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here, are you ready? Mm -hmm. So now. If you were in a, if this were a real interview and you didn't know me mm -hmm. and I was a strange man mm -hmm. who just came in for a job and we start talking and I ask you, do you have a boyfriend? Do men find you desirable, sexually desirable? Mm -hmm. And do you think women should wear bras in the workplace? And I just put those into the conversation right in the middle of it. You'd feel uncomfortable mm -hmm. talking to the mic. Would you? I feel uncomfortable. Why would you, are you asking me these questions? That it has nothing to do with what I'm applying for. Would you refuse to answer? Um, I would like to think so. Would you maybe get I up? Probably, and, I probably wouldn't see it at first. Like, do you have a boyfriend? But as soon as you get to like the sexuality stuff, I'd be like, why are you asking me this? Do you think you might get up and leave or something like that? Um, probably, depending on how how awkward it is for me. Okay, so, yeah? Okay, yeah. so let me show you something. So this person had the same idea and was really kind of interested in um, how it is that, that people, put, to, people accept certain things, okay? And in, in particular, how it is that women accept certain things that happen to them, right? These like kind of little sexual slights that didn't really make sense. So he, sent, so he gave an interview and in, a questionnaire out to 197 women. Two-thirds of the women who responded in the, to the interview, to the question, said, like, yeah, they would feel uncomfortable enough that they would not answer the, all those questions. Maybe the first one, but then they'd stop answering. And that 16 of 197 said they would get up and walk out. Okay? Got that? Which makes how, women in here. How many of you were feeling it for her in the moment? Could you imagine yourself being in that situation? That it's a role play and you're in this and this creepy guy starts asking you these questions about wearing bras in the workplace and you know this kind of stuff and how many women in here you don't have to raise your hands but how many of you would feel exactly like her yeah i'd probably stop answering at some point and maybe i'd even walk out right got it how many of you are going to say yeah definitely okay so then he said well let me actually try this because, I don't know, so he actually did mock interviews with only 25 women, and all 25 of them stayed right in the interview, right to the bitter end, said nothing, and didn't walk out. Did nothing. So here you are, right? You're imagining here, right? P's down here imagining, yeah, if I'm in that creepy situation with some creepy guy, I'm going to be over here. I'm going to use my volition. I'm going to use my choice. And I'm going to walk up these stairs and make a decision. Like, yeah, I'm not answering that question. Yeah, I'm going to walk out. Yeah, I'm not doing that. So I'm going to do that. Because, right? Because you're, you have power. You have power, right? You have power, right? You have power, right? You, you know, like, you're not, you know, nobody, there's no, there's no, you're not like a puppet down here. No one's just telling you what to do. There aren't men all around you saying like, no, you got to stick it out. You got to know. So naturally you think like, yeah, I'm going to do that. But what he finds is what we find all the time. It doesn't matter. Crank up the level of creepiness, go as far as you want to go. But there's something happens that leads you down here. It's almost like there are these like invisible strings on women here that is just like, like, you, you're just like this kind of, not, you're not, not a puppet in a, don't think, like think of this in the coolest sociological way, but there are ways in which our behavior, your behavior is 
not shaped by your choices, but your behavior, just like what I'm saying about who we'd be attracted to, is shaped by things outside of your control. But so there's something in the system, like I talked about a racialized system, but there's a sexualized and gendered system as well. It's like leads P and all these other women to something it's like these invisible strings. And we're up here and I'm like, there's somehow someone's like this big, here, hang on, I'll do it just like this. I'm going to be right behind you, right? Like this big puppet master. And like she's sitting here oper- talking like she's in control, like she's down there. But something's going on up here and pulling strings and moving along and this and that and all sorts of things are happening. And like, oh my God. And you think you're making a decision, right? But just like all the women think they're making a decision, and not one said, I'm going to refuse to answer that or get up and leave. So why is that and how is that? We all want to think we're there, and here we are. Yes. So what was the interview staged as? Because I feel like that has an influence on what... Or how like a woman may answer the interview questions. was staged as an actual real interview. He came like for in. What kind of job? Just a, just a random job, a random job working in different places. I feel like that's not specific. I don't know. I'm just. I feel like that. Wait. Has oh, an so you're thinking as a woman? You're thinking no women are really going to do this. Um, Doesn't matter. We do this. So you're thinking that no women actually pro- would feel uncomfortable and I they think wouldn't it just talk. De- there's. I don't know. There. I don't know. I like I'm just trying to think of like there may be other reasons that may not just be this like we, this 25 will... random women that are all equally as influenced to not get up and leave. I don't know. Dude, this is what we all do, my friend. This is what we all do, right? We all are going to be like, yes, but yes, but what about maybe the job was for, I don't know, like clothing design. No, no, no. I got you. Just follow me. And then maybe it's clothing design. It's like, well, but maybe it could like be about a bra or something, or maybe it's this, or maybe it's that. Like, I don't know, right? It's like, this, we, do, we do, this is one tiny study. There's so many studies, like they're, they're all over the place. It's like, we all are, want to be over here. And yet what we find is like, we don't act in the way that we think we might act. Just like, dudes, look, look, it's really really powerful. You know why what motivated this person to do this study was by the number of people who he learned had been somehow sexually assaulted and never spoke up. Because of course, me as a man, if I'm sexually assaulted in any way, shape or form, I'm going to speak up. Of course I am. And so therefore, Women, you might, obviously you weren't. You talk about it four years later. Why didn't you talk about it at the time? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you do something? It's like I would have done something, or other women would be like, "Yeah, well, I would have done something too." It's like really, everybody would do something until the moment it comes to do something, and then somehow these strings enter in. So you can say like, "Yeah, it would depend on the job." It would, maybe it wouldn't. I mean, it really doesn't matter because we do this stuff all the time and we see that, no, people don't act. We all think we're going to speak up. We all think we're going to do something and we don't. It's like, shit, we are not as powerful and strong-willed and so on as we think we are. You know what I mean? So no, you, you almost certainly, as I was just getting creepier and creepier in the interview, maybe alone in my office somewhere for a job that maybe involves running a camera maybe don't think me but just running a camera just a random job like that that has nothing to do with boyfriends how you dress sex anything like that and you think oh yeah no man i would speak up and i just keep getting creepier oh hey i like those earrings yeah hey you have nice lips and it just keeps going and going and going and everybody's gonna think the same thing you're gonna think oh but he's gonna get a little closer to me and, it's, and you're going to back up, but you're fucking not. You're not. You're going to stay right there, and you're going to be frozen in place, and you're going to be like, and I'm going to get creepier, and I'm going to be like, oh, yeah. And then it's, it's just, you got it? Yo, can and I give another example? It's almost like in the movie Legally Blonde, if anybody's seen it. Recently saw it, so, you know, whatever. Um, but in the movie... At one point, the main actress is being hit on by her boss, and the woman gets up and leaves. 
And we all assume we would all do that. Every woman in this room, you would be like, what the hell are you doing? And get up and leave. But in reality, we don't. And why is that? What is the social constructs or the strings that are holding us in place that don't allow us to move? The question is, what is happening? Yeah, yeah, what is happening? It's awesome. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to say that I really, I think that this doesn't just relate to gender. Because my mom's a psychologist, and so I watched this movie about, like, the Milgram exper exactly. experiments with her, where they put people, men and women, through an, exper an experiment where they made them believe that they were shocking another person. Yep. So they would give them a shock of, I don't know how many, it was a low voltage, because they would say, we want you to know, like, what this feels like. And so uh, it was an experiment to see how far people would go by being influenced by other people. So at the end, people were delivering like 250 volt shocks, so like these insane, I don't know how much, like these insane yeah. shocks to these people. And, then, and they weren't actually, but it was just an experiment to see how far people would go with someone sitting behind them saying, no, like just keep going, it's fine. Even though this person is like screaming, stop shocking me, like that really hurts just to see like how far people are, can be pushed. And then they stop eventually, yeah. right? And then because you can't even hear them anymore. Not always, no. No, 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 what I mean is the people stop screaming because they essentially have died. Yeah, yeah, so I think that it's not just related to gender. and like. No, issues. it's related so to it's so many things. Like, Listen, there, my life is filled with stories of me saying, by the time you get to my age, it's just filled with stories of me wishing I would have acted differently in certain situations. Yesterday, I met... Dude, can I tell you, yesterday morning, I was in a room with the former director of the CIA, and I'm standing next to this guy, and I'm like, I want to ask you a question, dude. I got a question for you. And I just went, <sighs> nothing came out. And I'm like, that will never happen again in my life. You know what I mean? <laughs> it happens all the time. This is just the nature of this stuff. Anyway, thanks, bro. Yo. Yo, go ahead. Last question, real fast. Yo, hang on, hang on. We got, hey, Pete, thanks. Go ahead. I, I have two questions. One is, what's the interviewer hot? The second one is, um, has there been an experiment for the other end? Wait, hang on. What was his first question, dude? Was the interviewer hot? Because the interviewer hot? Yeah. Nah, dude, that, that, oh. that's not part of it. No, it's All just, right. the, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just the average, yeah. Oh, did you have a second I, question? I had a second, I had a question? second question. And Wait, hang on. Was... we got to get a second question. You're going to have to help me with this. Go ahead, bro. Has there been an has there been experiments from the other end? For, on the other side? Mm -hmm. like, like looking like, at men? No, no, no. Like, it's so... like the, the places oh, in which men don't speak up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. All the time. Yeah, we have it. We, you know, it's a, in, a, in a thousand different situations. Hey, wait, by the way. Yo, yo, here's the most important thing. I'm going to, about tomorrow night. Um, wait, don't leave. Here's what, here's what you need to know. When you go into Eisenhower Auditorium, you know where it is. It's right next door to here, right? So you go in, you're going to either go to the right or to the left. Because it's like, it's like every other auditorium like this. You go in the back and you're either going to go around this way or you're going to go around that way. And when you start going around that way, there'll be some of our TAs. Somebody's going to be there, TAs, probably in a World in Conversation t-shirt or a Swiss 19 t-shirt, maybe Stream Team or something, I don't know, who are going to collect these. So you got to put your name on it, and then you got to hand it in. And, okay, is that cool? To them. That's the goal. And that's how we're going to know that you were there. So don't forget to do that. After you get inside the auditorium. Um. Yo, and if you don't have a ticket, come get one.